Hey everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. Uh, if you are just tuning into my channel for the first time, you are seeing uh, a video in a series of videos on something I call a hybrid vintage sewing machine. These are sewing machines that were made uh, anywhere from the 1970s through parts of the early 80s. And I call them hybrid because they have a lot of metal parts like the heirloom quality vintage machines that I love so much and consider worth restoring <clears throat> in spite of the, the time that, that can often be uh, required and invest, to invest in those. But these have some plastic components and I'm not just referring to the knobs, but they sometimes have internal plastic components. And uh, for a long time, I used to turn my nose up at these. I thought, oh, I don't want to mess with those. But then it occurred to me that many of you may have some of these or you may have bought them thinking that they were heirloom quality and maybe the machine is not broken and you want to service it. And so what I'm doing today is I'm showing you a series of things you can do to service a hybrid machine because if it's, if it's not broken and it doesn't require moving heaven and earth to, to restore or to recondition, then it, it would be a shame to throw it away. I, you know, I was taught never to throw anything away uh, by my parents and grandparents, and I, that sounds a little silly, but if you can keep something running, who knows? You know, this machine is a late 70s Janome. It's, it's over 40 years old, and I'm not convinced that it's broken. In some of my earlier videos, I talked to you all about, okay, you have to decide when, when, uh, uh, you know, you are willing to invest time. It's rarely about money and for parts, it's usually about the time. Uh, if something on the machine has failed and it's going to be expensive to purchase or difficult to locate, then you have to consider uh, the next step for the machine, which of course would be to salvage it. And if you don't want or need those parts, you definitely want to take it to a sewing vacuum center or any place that would repair older machines because they can use these parts. You never want to throw anything like this in the dump because there are people out there who could maybe use, you know, a, a tension assembly for a Janome and they can keep their machines running. Uh, it's just a shame to waste anything, I believe. But anyway, today I'm getting some really nice natural light and I want to take advantage of that. And what we're going to do, I, I showed you all in the last video that I, how to remove the top of the free, of the arm, of the a free arm machine. And in the last video, uh, we had a sudden camera movement, so just pretend we were bungee jumping, guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just have to roll with it sometimes. I, I don't care to do polished and fancy videos. I want my videos to be real. I'm a real person, and I want you guys to see me when I succeed, and sometimes when I flub it and I, you know, I drop stuff. That just makes it hopefully more realistic for you and will encourage you not to be afraid to try to work on your own machine. Uh, as is always the case, you definitely want to unplug your machine. You know, this that's obvious, but all of us can use reminders now and then, including me. So um, anyway, you don't want your machine plugged in. I don't even have the cord attached to this one. I've got it on my bench uh, or on a table rather. Now, the next thing we want to do here, or the, the thing I'm going to show you today, is now that I have lubricated all of the metal moving parts inside the... I've got it sitting up on a board here because I wanted to elevate it just a bit. Um, now that we've got all of the, the uh, metal parts lubricated and there was not really any dust in here because it was covered. However, one place that you always are going to find dust on any machine of any age is the hook and shuttle and bobbin case area. It's just inevitable. All threads regardless of how high quality or regardless of the fiber, they're going to shed a little bit. That's just the nature of it. And that's okay. What we're going to do today is I'm going to show you, I'm going to get in here and do some cleaning. And then we're going to take this area apart. Uh, and then again, this is a class 15. It's very common. Many of you will see these in your, your machines. Um, and we'll take it apart. We'll clean it and then we'll put it back together. It's actually not that bad. It's not as bad as it looks. So I'll grab my little lint brush and we'll get to work. You know, something that occurred to me to mention to you all is to, to, to talk about some of the things you might need to do this before, um, before you set up. <clears throat> I'm going to have cotton swabs. That's no surprise to you guys. You know, I go through them like crazy uh, and that's fine. I've got a little, this is something I was using to do test stitching on a machine and uh, I'm not going to do any more with that. So I'll use that as a little rag. Um, let's see. 
I have a lint brush. Uh, I like this style because it has a little, a very sort of, it has a soft end and a stiff end, and it's really good for getting in machine, but whichever one you have should hopefully work fine. I have a larger brush, but it's gonna be more limited in terms of um, getting to this area. I have isopropyl alcohol. Uh, I think it's 91%, so it's the high, high concentration. Um, if you don't have a lint brush, you can try using an old toothbrush. Now, the toothbrush is not as easy to get into these areas, but it might prove helpful for you. And sewing machine oil, which we're going to finish with. Now, I have a micro, sort of needle-sized oiler in addition to my normal oiling bottle. Many of you will not have this. Uh, they're, not, they're not hard to find, but they're not a lot of people don't have them. And if you don't have it, don't worry about it. It's not a make or break deal here, but it's useful. Okay, now we're going to zoom in. Let's change the angle just a bit for you guys. I'm going to zoom in here. I try to get these made at certain times of day because I really, I really like natural light. It just makes things a lot easier. And let's come in even a little bit more. There we go. See how that will work. Now, a lot of times <clears throat> you're going to find uh, you're going to be in a situation like this, where you're going to have um, you're going to have your machine. You're going to have this door open. Now, you'll notice I still have the top here. Uh, I haven't put the top back on the free arm yet. Uh, I wanted to be able to get to my feed dogs. Now, another way to do this is to um, you can take your needle plate off to get into your feed dogs. You normally don't need to remove the top of the of the free arm in order to get to your dogs to clean them. Your dogs, your free your feed dogs to clean them. And and what we're going to do here, I'm actually going to put the cover back onto the free arm because that will help reduce as we move some of this lint out of here. Uh, you know, we don't want to get it down into this area unnecessarily. So we'll go ahead and get this back onto the machine. and But we're going to remove our needle plate because we're going to want access to the feed dogs. And again, some of you may or may not have, uh, I have a screwdriver tip set that I, that I use. And I like it because they're not tapered and they're less likely to strip the screws in a machine. If you don't have a set, I would suggest I think it's a great thing to have, not just for machines, but for many, uh, many projects. But if you don't have one and you don't want to try to get one, that's okay. What I would suggest that you do, however, let's pan back out. We're not ready to get in there yet. Uh, what I would suggest is if you're going to use a regular screwdriver, be extra careful because you don't want to strip the screws. And if the screws give you any resistance whatsoever, let's see if these do for me. Oh, they're, they're a little, little tight. Uh, and I've got the right size tip here. What that means is uh, you're going to want to you're going to want to lubricate and get them loosened because if you force it, especially with a tapered screwdriver, your chances of damaging these screws is pretty high. Remember, they may have sat here a long time, and many of us don't know how long the machines have been dormant. So I've got a little WD-40 here. Uh, if you have a different brand, you can do that. Just remember, this is not an oil; it's more of a it's used to loosen uh, things that are that are kind of stuck, whether whether or not they're rusted. These are not rusted. <clears throat> and anyway, you can let that sit. Uh, how long it takes is uh, you know it's going to vary. It depends on where your machine was stored, for how long. Uh, but again, the point here is that these screws you don't want to damage them. Uh, don't be in a hurry. If you're in a hurry and you're restoring a sewing machine. Uh, you may not be happy with the results. So this, this is one of those things where you can do a little at a time. As I mentioned in the last video, you know, don't expect to sit down and just restore the whole machine in an hour. That's not practical. I spend quite a few hours on machines and that's largely what I charge people for. I rarely have to charge for a part. Um, occasionally I do, but that's, that's unusual. Almost everything that people pay me for to go through sewing machines, whether it's theirs or one that I have found that they purchase, is all about um, uh, getting things unstuck, getting them adjusted, getting them cleaned. And then if parts are replaced, it's usually a soft part, like a belt, 
uh, a bobbin tire. You know, those things, uh, even cords go bad over time, but um, there. Now, it, for, in this case, it did not take long for this to work. That doesn't mean WD-40 is a miracle product. I mean, I've had to let machines, you guys have seen that Kenmore, it's still sick. I'm still struggling with the Kenmore. And if any of you were curious, uh, it's still there. It's still waiting for uh, more attempts on my part. So I haven't given up. It's an heirloom quality machine that, that Kenmore is. And I'm willing to invest a lot more time and sweat in that than I am uh, something like a hybrid Janome. But I'm trying to also do these videos for the hybrid machines like this one to show you that they do have value. Uh, I don't want to be a snob when it comes to these. Now, I'll take the, you can see the plate came off, right? Pretty easy. Now, I'm going to put, we can put the plate back on after we get this on. And let's see, I can take, sort of clean this area a little bit. Um, now, you might think, well, why don't you just clean the feed dogs while you got the lid off? Again, I, I would like to limit the amount of dust and grime that's going to go into this area because it's normally kept very clean. Now, I have two screws that I showed all of you when I took off the lid of this free arm in the last video. And if you remember, I mentioned to you that sometimes the manufacturer designed it and they have these screws are different they have different size heads and they're different lengths. <clears throat> uh, not sure if that actually reads very well on the camera there. And so I want to be sure, as, as all of you will recall, whenever I put screws back into a machine, I always lubricate them. And I do that, it's sort of uh, to sort of proof it for the future, right? Because one of the reasons, you know, they've been sitting there a long time and I'm not worried if, if I or anyone else has to go and service this, it's not going to be a big deal. So I believe, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, I think the long screw went there in the end. And I'll know very quickly if it doesn't because it won't, it won't seat all the way. And then we'll just take it out. Trial and error. See if this will fit. I wonder if I can get it under. Yeah. Okay. And as you would with any other screw, you'll know if the threads are taking or not. And if they're not, then you want to stop and pull it out and try again. I don't typically have that difficult a time with with uh, some of these. Others, I, I you can. Sometimes that will happen to you. But again, patience pays off. Uh, it certainly has for me many times when I've been working on machines. Now, I know that I, I ended up putting these screws in the right spot because they are seating down as they should. Not sure if watching someone put screws into a machine is, let's see if I do it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am mistaken. I don't know. Let's see. Yep. There you go, guys. You just saw, well, now you can see. Uh, I put the short screw over here and it's not finishing and I put the long one over here and it's not flush. Well, it doesn't take long to figure out that they, they need to go back the other way. And you will do things like this. You will take screws out and you might think, oh, I forgot which one, which, which screw went where. And as long as it's the same thread size, then you, can, you, can, uh, you will discover your error by trial and error. Uh, if you ever have screws that are different thread sizes though, if the screw doesn't go in, you'll know it pretty quick and you definitely want to stop because you don't want to cross thread the screw and, and harm the, uh, the screw hole or the, or the screw itself. And fortunately, these two screws have the same thread size. They just have a different length. Okay, so I've got the, the, both of the screws out. No harm, no foul. And now I'm going to take the long screw and I'm going to put it on this side. And if it goes flush, we'll know we have the right one. Because I did not note when I took it out which one was which. Because I took them out and I've not worked on the Janome. And I didn't know that they were different size. But I do know um, 
Some machines keep it a little simpler and others don't. So let's see, let's try this. Let's see if that long screw would like to go flush with the deck of the sewing machine. Of course, if you had a service manual, that would tell you, aha, there we go, that one's flush. Let's try this one, which looks awfully similar, by the way, to the screws that, that, uh, that attach the needle plate. Not sure what their method was and when, why they decided, uh, the manufacturers and the engineers, why they decided to make them a certain size, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we apply them to the, to the place where they're supposed to go. There we go. They're both snug. They are both flush, or they're actually countersunk, under the lid of the free arm. Now you know you've got the screws in the right place. When I said I like people to watch me goof, I wasn't kidding, apparently. Okay, so now it's time to zoom in. The first thing I want to do is we're going to look at these feed dogs. And I'm going to get my angle and zoom in here so you can see. Now you're going to have, it's very typical to see uh, lint in the feed dog area. You can see some coming up. There's a little, little dust bunny right there. Uh, and again, this is normal. There's nothing wrong with the machine. All of your machines, vintage or otherwise, will do this. It's just kind of a, and even if they say they have a built-in lint cleaner, you know, well, that's great, but you're still going to need to clean them occasionally. All sewing machines were really designed for this, all right? It's, now, I'm going here and I'm taking my brush and I'm just kind of kicking because the lint, you know, the lint is, is like a dog with a bone. It wants to hold on to stuff, but it'll come right out. And it just did. Now, uh, down in this area, you're going to see some lint. There's probably going to be more behind here, so I'm not going to clean out that little door at the moment. But now we're going to zoom in. Uh, let's see. If you're not sure, by the way, if you've gotten enough of the lint off your feed dogs, you can take a flashlight and they look pretty clean. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, depending on the light you have and the machine you have, <clears throat> some areas of the machine will be easier to see than others. But you definitely want to see what you're doing because uh, if you don't, you're going to be you know, taking things apart and overhauling and then finding you have to do it again. That's not fun. Okay, so I'm going to go into here and these little these are like little flippers. They almost look like the flippers on a pinball, old pinball machine. And they are held in place <coughs> with, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they have a little knob, a knob, let's see, what would we call that? They have a nub <coughs> underneath that holds them in place. These are plastic, sometimes they're metal, I believe, yeah. And it just kind of slides, this one slides clockwise, and then the other one slides counterclockwise. And you see the little nub that they were holding on to. Now, I want to take my bobbin case out. We're going to be taking the bobbin case out. We'll, uh, uh, I'm actually going to, I'll pull out a different video for how to look at a bobbin case and what you want to do with that. Let's set that aside for a moment. So we're going to deal with our shuttle and our race. Now the, the race has a cover or like a ring plate here and it should, it's, it's held in place by these little flippers. I call them flippers. And I'm going to grasp the ring and we'll pull it right out. And any of you who have a class 15 vintage machine, almost all of you will have something that looks like this. Notice it has, where's, a, where's my pointer? Notice it has a little notch in the top, right? And that notch is important because that's where the little finger or the ear, depending on what you'd like to call it, of your bobbing case Right? When your bobbin case goes in, you know which position it goes into because these line up. But uh, you want to take this off. There's a little bit of lint on it. Like I say, that's normal. Let's turn it around see what's on the other side. Uh, I mostly see some lint, maybe a little oil. It hasn't been oiled in a long time. It's mostly a little bit of grime. Not, it's not bad. So let's uh, take our alcohol and cotton swabs. That's, that's almost like a hallmark when you're a sewing machine restorer. You're going to be, you're going to be using a lot of alcohol and a lot of cotton swabs. So here, before I take any alcohol, just 
corrected myself there. Take your lint brush because a lot of this stuff could be loose and the best way to get it off is just to brush it off. It's really that simple and take, I got the stiff Brussels, br Brussels, bristles. <laughs> I've got the stiff bristles of the brush here. And I'm just going to kind of go around and you can go on the front side. You'll, you may see a little bit there on the top. And I just, you know, I just uh, blew my breath on it. There you go. There it is. And most of it came off there. That was loose. There wasn't a lot of oil in there. Now I can take my cotton swab with alcohol that I've dipped in the alcohol. And I'm going to go in here and just take it and uh, just pull it around the different little nooks and crannies of this ring. You can see I'm getting some stuff here. This may seem like, uh, you know, going extra mile, but remember the hook of your sewing machine that forms your stitch with the lower thread, it actually <clears throat> is going to be uh, pushing, this ring is going to hold your hook inside the race. And so it's an important part of the machine. This is not like a, like a, a frou-frou thing. This is, uh, this is an important part of how, important part of the machine that helps your stitch form. So you want to give it some respect. You know, it hasn't, doesn't look like it's been given any attention for a while. Not much, much going on here. Now, uh, we'll set that aside. Let's see, up next, we have the hook. Now the hook, should come out. It's basically resting in here. So sure enough, I pulled on it and it came right out. I once had a customer who got their machine home and they were new to sewing and they they had taken this apart and were afraid that they had broken the machine. And I, I, uh, I, I was able to give them the good news. No, you haven't broken the machine at all. It was just waiting for you to re to re put it back together. Okay, you saw me I almost put to take the alcohol on there and I was like, uh, 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 no, I just caught myself. Look at the little uh, dust, uh, little lint ball I pulled out of there. And when you see some of this lint, this is not bad. I've seen a lot worse. This doesn't mean that the person who last used the machine was necessarily um, not good at taking care of it. You know, lint forms. That's just kind of the nature of sewing machines. So uh, that's not really anything they should be blamed for. Uh, okay, now that I've used my brush, I've got the lint out, we're going to take this cotton swab. I'm just going to take it inside on the inside rim. You'll see a combination of a little bit of lint, mostly old oil, and we want to get that out of there. This is not bad. I've, I've cleaned uh, uh, hooks that were a lot dirtier than this. Now I think I want to take one of my tapered uh, cotton swabs and I'm going to roll up my fingers. I'd like to get an extra narrow tip there because there's a groove down in this hook. I'd like to get that cotton swab in there if I can and get a little bit more of this out of there. And you can see I'm pulling some up here. It's not bad, but you know, while you're in here, you're doing it. Why not? You know, why not clean it? You, uh, you will be surprised at just how well a machine can run and how differently your machine will run if you give it the uh, love and attention it's been waiting for. And some of these machines have been waiting a long time, guys. <laughs> okay, so I've got my hook cleaned. I don't see any burrs on it. You want to feel sometimes if the hook has been damaged, it can affect your stitch formation, but this one feels, feels nice and uh, it's sharp. It's, I don't feel any irregular parts to it. If your hook is ever damaged, by the way, it's not common, but if it is, you can get another one. Not, not a big deal. Now, now what you see here, this is the shuttle. This is the piece, and this is an oscillating machine, right? It's a class 15, and you notice it rocks back and forth like an old style top loading washing machine. And now you see, this is the piece that I lubricated uh, in the free arm, and now it's, it's, uh, it's happy, it's rolling around. But let's go down in behind here because I think we're going to find some lint. Oh yeah, it looks like a little mouse's nest. Look at that, guys. <laughs> Look at this. It, you, you know, you, you don't notice it at first and then you think, wow, holy cow, let's, let's zoom in and I'll show you the, this is what I pulled out of here. And it's tricky because sewing machines, um, when they're well engineered, they will run for you even when they, you know, the engineers knew that people didn't always clean their lint, you know, 
twice a day. And so they, they made them uh, with the ability to run up to a point, but they're not running at their optimum. Here's another little, now I've got my, uh, my cotton swab with the alcohol. I wanna see if I can pull any lint from in here. Yeah, getting some out of there. It's fascinating just to see what the machines will put up with, but once you give the machine this kind of cleaning and adjustment, my goodness, I think you may be surprised at just how, how much more power and how much better a sewing machine it is when it gets to function the way it was designed to. By the way, don't be surprised if you find little pieces of thread because sometimes thread breaks and it will settle down in this area. That's actually a bigger issue than lint even because thread can end up getting tangled around the mechanical parts of your sewing machine and in your sewing machine can have a really bad day and it can literally freeze up on you. Notice I pull that, oops. Notice I pull this, this actually came um, from underneath the feed dog. There was something hanging under there. Get out of there. So again, you know, the, when you see this, guys, you may think, well, gosh, that's, you know, is a sewing machine a lot of work? Normally not when you take care of it. Many of these machines have not been optimally maintained, and that's why we go in and do this kind of work. For those of you, and I've said this before, <clears throat> if you're interested in buying one of these machines because your real passion is the sewing, not the, not the tinkering, you don't have to, other than cleaning your feed dogs normally, and oiling your machine, uh, these machines are not maintenance intensive. A lot of the stuff you're seeing me do has, has been overdue for a long time. And that's why, you know, I wanna always wanna be sure that you, that none of you get the feeling that, oh my God, an old sewing machine is a pain to maintain. It's not. They're actually beautifully simple to maintain. But these have gone a long time without maintenance. So what you're seeing me do is the, you know, this is the 50,000 mile tune up uh, that they've been going, they've been waiting for, and they're finally going to get some attention. Now, as I'm rocking the shuttle back and forth, what I'm doing is I'm getting it out of the way so I can come in here. The race is this, this big, uh, it looks like a little bowl. It has a rim, like the rim of a bowl. And I'm going in here and cleaning because that race is very important. The race is the area that the shuttle and the hook uh, slide against. And, and we really, really need to be sure that we've got lint and old oil out of there. You don't want it in there because uh, it slows down. It's like bogging the machine down. It's like putting lead weight on your feet when you're trying to jog. It just makes it so much harder for the machine. Okay, now I'm just gonna, gonna take my brush in here one more time, make sure I've gotten all this out. Okay, now before so we've cleaned our hook, we've cleaned our, uh, our race cover. Uh, we haven't done the bobbin case, I'll do that separately. But before we put any of this back, we want to lubricate. Now, unlike other areas of your sewing machine, when you put oil in them, this is an area that you want to put very little oil. Now, why is that? Because oil, as many of you may know, is like a magnet for dust. And if you, if you, if you put too much oil, uh, lint, instead of falling down, is gonna stick to it and you're gonna have what I call lint mud. And that's not something that you probably want to have. Now, this is an, a needle oiler. It's supposed to give very little, but you wanna be careful because the oil can come streaming out of these as well. So, let's look at our shuttle. And I'm going to put, let's get it down here. We'll make it easier to see. I'm going to put one little drop here just because this is an old machine. And I want that oil to get down in there. I'm not drenching this with oil because if you do that, like I say, you do not want a lint muddy mess and that's what oil will do. <clears throat> but the, one of the most important areas to, to put oil is going to be, um, let's see, in the track of the race, which is here, and I may put another one on the other side, right there. Might wanna give you guys a little bit more zoom. 
going to put a drop right here. Okay. Now, remember that your hook is going to rest uh, on this space. And the hook, of course, another way to do this, by the way, is you could, instead of oiling that rim in the race right there, you could also oil the surface of, it would help if I held it in front of the camera, um, you, can, you can oil the, the, the rim here of your hook. That's also uh, another way to lubricate it. But notice I'm using very little tiny drop, tiny, tiny amount. Uh, I can't, you know, you don't need a lot. The, the machine doesn't require lots of oil like the motor in, in, in a car. Now, we want to put this back. Before I do, I can always, I can take, actually, probably take my rag here, put a little alcohol, and I'm going to just wipe up some of this excess, some of the lint stuck to the plastic, I think mostly because of sort of static electricity. Now, uh, one thing to mention to you guys, this is always important with a steel door that covers your uh, your shuttle bobbin area. It's especially important here. I don't, I'm going to zoom in and see if I can get this to show up for all of you, but I want you to see the hinges. This is part of the issue with hybrid machines. They started replacing pieces that used to be steel with plastic. Now, there are plastic hinges here and they hold a steel uh, rod that acts, uh, it sort of pivots on that rod, and that rod is seated in the steel, which is in this part of the machine. It's really important to lubricate this. It always is, but especially here. If I put a drop of sewing machine oil there on that, in that little area, and then I come over on this side, which is, hmm, I'm gonna have to get it right there because it's not as easy to see. I want that to move very smoothly, okay? I don't want any resistance because if those metal parts are not moving well together, what can happen is um, you will put more stress on the plastic and it's more apt to break, okay? I can already tell this is moving a little bit better. Uh, and that's what I wanted. I wanted it to to move and not have to work too hard. It is just a little door, but it's very nice to have that. Okay, so I'm gonna come up and, oh yeah, it's already moving better. You still have to be careful with these guys because again, you know, this is not the strongest thing in the world. Fortunately, it's not really under normally a lot of stress, but you definitely want it to move freely uh, and, you know, give it a break. It's, it's, it's not the strongest part of your machine. So, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, leave this here with you guys. You now, let's say you've, if you followed along with me, you've taken all this apart and you're like, oh no, don't stop now. I'm going to make the next video where we put all these parts back in and then I'll talk to you about your bobbin case. Uh, one of the most important parts of your machine and how to inspect it when it's been sitting in a machine like this one. I don't know how long it's been sitting there. We'll take a look and we will clean it and I'll show you how it gets lubricated. Yes, it actually does have a place where a tiny, teeny bit of oil needs to go uh, on rare occasions or seldom, but uh, there is a regular maintenance for your bobbin case. Thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate you hanging in there with me with the hybrid machine here, hybrid vintage machine as I call them. Oh, so uh, it may look like I've spent a lot of time because we got a lot of videos on this machine, but compared to something like an heirloom vintage machine, uh, such as some of the others I've worked on, this has so far not taken a terrible amount of time. And that's, that's useful to know when you're, when you're working on a machine that is not heirloom, but it's, it's still pretty useful. It's still working and we're going to see how long that uh, we can keep it in operation. Thanks for watching, everybody.